It's good to be before you here again this morning at C3. It is, for you if you're visiting, it is Family Sunday. Uh, there are sermon sheets for the kids if you did not get one. It might be a little noisy for some, but that's okay. It is, to me, it's so wonderful to see this many kids, uh, children in church. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but again, uh, I'll say it. Uh, when Heidi and I, when we moved down here, when our family moved down to Florida, we knew the 80 degrees on November 27th and getting to wear flip-flops with jackets and palm trees. It's why we came down here, but when we found C3 and you guys loving on us, nurturing us, teaching us, uh, I would have never imagined that, I think this is my third or fourth time before you giving a message, we would have never imagined that, but you know what? God knew, and we are thankful for that. If you've been with us the last few weeks, the last couple of months, we've been journeying through 1 John. Uh, we've seen that we have assurance that we can have as believers. Uh, we've seen the path or the way uh, for everlasting and eternal joy. God is the light of the world. That Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. We learn, we've seen not to be part of this world. Last week we looked at Antichrist with a small a and the Antichrist. And we're going to continue this morning journeying through 1 John 2, 24 through 27. If you'd like to open uh, your Bibles or turn them on uh, and follow along as we look at our passage this morning. Again, it's 1 John, the letter uh, from John, uh, second chapter, verses 24 through 27. Let's look at God's Word. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as, as he taught you, abide in him. I love what I heard this week about this passage, that it's shallow enough for a baby to bathe in, but deep enough for an elephant to drown. And we're going to look at, a, a maybe has to develop a path through these passages and lay out a game plan for this morning as we dive in through these texts from the Bible. I want to look at what abiding in the truth means, how to avoid the spiritual deception that John warns about, and then developing discernment by abiding in the Word and in the Spirit, and sort of a caveat, uh, while putting together the message over the last few weeks, and getting into the Word, I got excited. And, and Tony's mentioned this, and I've heard others mention this, that when you get into the Word, you should be excited about what you're learning, what you're seeing, what you're, what you're getting from the Holy Spirit. And I could see myself, uh, I, I'd write some notes down, so I can see myself doing Tony's airplane arms. Or my uncle, who wanted to be here today from Tennessee, who's been in the pulpit for 50 years, he gets animated and excited. But you're going to get teacher me. And you know what? That's okay. As long as God's speaking through me, using me as his vessel. Um, sorry you're getting teacher me, but that's okay. As long as I'm true to the word and just let the Holy Spirit speak through me this morning. So let's dive into the word and see what John has for us this morning. This letter that he wrote to the believers of his day, warning, but also giving them the assurances that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. So verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And we've, we've looked at this, the beginning. Is this the beginning of time? Is this the beginning of our life? No, it's, it's the beginning of Jesus' life. It's the beginning of his ministry. So as we look at this, this first point that we want to look at is what does it mean to abide in the truth? And you could almost call this, you could do a lesson just on abiding in the truth. Because the word abide, is, it appears three times just in that one verse. And two more times in the few verses that follow. 
And also says, I've written to you and what you've heard, and the word's very important, what we've heard that needs to be part of your life. But you're not going to get any Disney references today. You'll get teacher references. The SAT word of the day is abide. What does the word abide mean? We don't use that word much anymore. It means it remains. It, it's part of you. It's part of your innermost self. It's something that you accept. The younger uh, over to my right, uh, maybe abiding would be listening to your parents or people at school, rules at school, even rules in our, our society. So it's something that's part of you. It becomes part of your innermost being. And you may say, well, John doesn't mention the word or the gospel here. But what you heard from the beginning, that refers to Christ himself. And the person and the work of Jesus is the gospel. And the gospel comes to us through God's word. And those that wrote the New Testament, they had been with Jesus. They heard his teachings in person. They saw his miracles. They saw him after he'd risen from the dead. They knew the Old Testament prophecies pointing to his birth and his ministry. They knew the prophecies were being fulfilled. That's why it's so important to abide in the word. It's the truth. It's the beginning. It's the gospel. Jesus tells us in 14.6, he's telling Thomas, I am the way, the truth, the life. And abiding in the truth provides us the assurance as believers for that everlasting and eternal joy. That's how you get there. It's not about the here and now. It's about eternity. It's also why I believe on Sunday mornings, whether it's myself, Tony, Matt, Josiah, guest guest pastor, or wherever you may call your home church, that it be a Bible-based church, that they're preaching the word, that it's equipping the saints for spiritual warfare as you go out for the week, that we need to hear the gospel often and correctly so that when we have the opportunity, we can share it often and boldly and correctly. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let's continue. In verse 25, and this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. By abiding in him and he in us, we have this amazing gift. You take away the good news. You take away the gospel. We're we're depraved. We're totally depraved. We deserve death and eternal condemnation. We deserve being thrown in the lake of fire. But we need to rejoice. We need to remember the good news and share the good news and focus on that good news and not dwell on the negatives. And it's a chance to put God's sovereignty in practice that we have hope. We have a promise after life here on earth. And again, putting God's sovereignty into perspective Maybe the election doesn't go your way. It's okay. God's in control. Maybe you're laying in the hospital and you're getting good results or you're getting bad results. God's in control. You get the promotion at work or the guy that hides in the work closet gets the promotion ahead of you. It's okay. God is in control. That's the good news is that we're not worried about the here and now. It's eternity. God also didn't give us a list of rituals to perform to achieve this salvation. Yes, there are things, a new way to live, a new uh, getting closer to God and becoming more Christ-like. But to achieve the salvation, it's not acts and performances and things to do. That wouldn't be good news. The good news is God promises his his eternal life. It's something that we didn't have to work for, but we accept it. Think Two examples that came to mind in Mark chapter 2. Some of us may have heard the story before. When the paralytic man is let down through the roof on a gurney in front of Jesus. And what does Jesus say in Mark 2 verse 5? Jesus saw their faith and he said to the paralytic man, 
paralytic son, uh, man, son, your sins are forgiven. What, did he do, what had he done to achieve that? Just his faith. It was a free gift. We see this all throughout Jesus' ministry. The thief on the cross next to Jesus. Luke 23, verse 43, he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That leads to a whole sermon series, Paradise. What is heaven going to be like? All I know is that if you're going to a place where the pavement is made out of gold, it's going to be amazing. I can't even, my wildest dreams can't even touch what it's going to be like. Let's continue in our text, though. 1 John 2, 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And this brings us to our second point of avoiding spiritual deception. And we learned last week, active deceivers are the Antichrist, the small a Antichrist. And the best way to avoid deception is to know the truth ahead of time. Spend time in the Word and know what the truth is that can help keep you from being deceived. And we need to accept the fact people are going to try to deceive us all throughout life. Whether it's taking your car to the shop and just knowing you're going to come back with extra things they want to have done. If you see me sweating a little bit, it's not because of you guys. This time tomorrow, I'm going to be at the dentist. Uh, and I don't know about you, but when, every time I go to the dentist, they find extra things to charge me for and to insert pain. And even students over here to the, the right might know the game Among Us. It's a pretty popular game, they obviously do, where you are trying to deceive, you're an imposter, and you're trying to deceive the people that are playing the game with you. And it's the imposter's job to try to get all the crewmates out of the game before they figure out who you are. And you're getting them out of the game, out of the game. They're either trying to complete tasks or, or figure out who the imposter is. So we've got games for, for young people trying to teach you how to be a deceiver. You know, I'm trying to, I won't, because I don't know what everybody does for a living, so I will not mention any, uh, any careers that that might be a good game to practice with. But that we have a game just to, for deceiving. And when John was writing this 2,000 years ago, the group that he was warning against were a group called the Gnostics. I mentioned them a couple of months ago. The, the Gnostic, Gnos, Gnosis, or Gnosis, uh, was the Greek word for knowledge. And it was a dangerous heresy of that day. And the Gnostics were trying to say that salvation wasn't through Christ, but through a special knowledge that you could achieve. And John wanted to expose these false teachers, just as we have false teachers today. And you've got to be aware of them, because you can easily fall for it. I know I will turn on the television sometimes at night, just see who's on Good Life or TBN, just to watch it and just see if I can um, notice anything that's deviating from the Word. It's very easy to go, that, man, they're, they're skilled. Sometimes they're not even really trying to deceive you. They think they're right. The Gnostics 2,000 years ago, they just believed they were right with this special knowledge. They may not have even been actually trying to deceive, but they were still a false teacher. It was a heresy. And the enemy, Satan's been trying to sow confusion in the church since the time of the apostles. Paul even warned in 2 Timothy 3.13, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, Deceiving and being deceived. Again, that's why it's so important to abide in the word. After you've accepted Jesus and you've repented, this is where your heart comes in. The word must be in your heart. It must be in your mind. It must be in your soul. And it's not just new believers. It's not just baby Christians that get deceived. We see well-trained pastors. We see entire denomina denominations that fall victim to this. If Satan can confuse people over the gospels, it's a domino effect. And everything else can be affected. 
And we see this in the world today. And it saddens us. It's important to note that 500 years ago, the 16th century French theologian and pastor you might have heard from um, us or heard us mention a few times, John Calvin, said it's the duty of a godly pastor to drive away the wolves and warn the flock, us in the congregation, about those that want to pervert the gospel. It's the duty of the elders as well. I don't think Tony will mind me sharing this with you. Uh, if he does, he can pull me away real quick. But and I love this about Tony. If he will send a, a message to us, you know, thoughts, notes. How did the sermon go today? He's wanting us to make sure that he's following the word, that he's true to the word. I want to make sure I'm not up here uh, speaking heresy and, and false uh, doctrine. It's our duty. So, if, if again, if we're up here delivering a message, if we tell you something wrong, or we just give you positive, feel-good, good housekeeping sermons, that's not what we need. It's not what, you don't, we don't need to hear that in today's world. We need to hear about Jesus. It's all we have, it's all we need, it's all we'll ever need. We also have to be warned about others that teach with serious errors in their message. Like I said, it's a matter of eternity. There are thousands of people sitting in evangelical church services right now that believe they're saved. Uh, I'm going to deviate for a, a short moment from, from the scripture. I, I, I want to share this moment. Last fall, we were able to, uh, Heidi and I were able to go with Tony and several others uh, from uh, Josiah was there. Um, I could tell you about going to the varsity and getting chili dogs, but that's not the great moment. Paul Washer, I don't know if you've, you may not even know who Paul Washer is. Your homework this week, get on YouTube and, and find Paul Washer. He um, greatly respect him. Um, man of God, I uh, love his, his messages. But he was the, the last speaker of this conference up in Atlanta. And if you've ever been to Atlanta or if you're from Atlanta, you know the World Congress Center. There was probably six, 7,000 of us in there. You could have heard a pin drop as he was preaching. And he was preaching mainly to the pastors and the elders in the group. And yet we're there. We've been singing. The, the music was great. The messages were great. And he said, there's people sitting in here right now that think they're saved and they're not. at a conference for Christ, at a conference for pastors. And that just, it, it struck me. It's like, I need to even look at myself. You know, some of us grew up in churches where we had altar calls and that'll get you saved. No, it won't. My favorite was, as you're praying, keep your eyes closed, raise your hand. And I'd always try to peek and see who raised their hand. It's like church seven up. Those of you that are old enough that ever played 7-Up. That, that doesn't get you saved. I've said the sinner's prayer. Mm -mm. I've done more things good than bad. Mm -mm. I send in a check. I listen to, to uh, or I'm at church every Sunday, or I listen to, only to the Christian music stations. And, and another caveat, I get two points for two caveats in the same day. Uh, some of you will get that. If you've watched the Hillsong documentary, it made me think, and some of us said that, you know, you gotta be careful with, with worship teams too. If you're coming to church just for the music, not the right or best reason to attend church. But I wonder why certain songs bring me to tears. A worldly moment for a moment, and y'all did give me two albums for pastor appreciation. Hi, now we're at the Eagles concert about a year ago. And I'm sitting there bawling my eyes out listening to the Eagles. <laughs> a well-placed, uh, a well-placed, what do you call it? Um, chord change. What do you, uh, key, key change, thank you. you. We did it today in a song. It, it will bring you to emotion. And, and pastors that are preaching false gospel, they're good at that. They're skilled. They know how to bring emotion to you. Just... I'm not going to preach the word. I'm just going to tell you feel-good stories or stories to scare you. 
we've got to be careful. We've got to abide in the word. And I'm sorry, I'm not sorry to tell you, again, all we need is Jesus. If it takes an hour and a half, that's okay. You might be a little late to lunch. That's fine. Take a brother or sister in Christ with you. Y'all can get to know each other while you're waiting for your table. The Puritans, they would have 16, 17 hour services. You ready for that? They didn't have television and football back then. But again, if we're up here and we go long, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be a reason to get up and leave or um, like I'm not coming back to hear him preach again. The word is so important. So what can we do? What do we do? You never grow tired of hearing the gospel. I don't know about you, but I need to hear it every week, almost every day. Because I'm a totally depraved sinner. And I'm losing the... I was like, why is that coming down? I don't know, put it in my pocket. Let the word abide in you. Read it. Open the word every day. Read it over and over. Surround yourself with people that believe the same way you do and that they keep Jesus as the main thing. You do that, you'll be able to spot a deceiver. You'll be able to spot an error in the message. If you apply the gospel to every area of your life, you'll be better armed against spiritual deception. And again, maybe this is me getting topical for 15 seconds here, but if you pl apply the gospel to your prayer life, to your family life, to your marriage, to your finances, to your work, to your career. Is everything always going to be great? No. But it gives you hope and etern for eternal joy. It gets you through the bad times. It brings you closer to God. You apply the gospel. You keep Jesus first in those areas of your life. It will make a difference. Yes, you will have pain, but it's not about the now. It's about an eternity in that place that uses this gold as pavement. It's about being with our creator. Spending eternity with Jesus. Let's look at the remainder of our text for the day. I could go on, but I, again, I don't want to dwell on just the negatives. We've got too much positive to look at. But in 1 John 2, 27, But the anointing you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But, has an, but as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as, as it has taught you, abide in him. So it brings us to our third point. Developing discernment, which is judgment, which is written in the right way, by abiding in the word and spirit. And it brings us back to the gospel message. So what's John, John's basically wrapping up his own points here. It's like, look, I've, the gospel's what you need. Yes, there's people out there that are going to try to deceive you, but don't worry about that because we've got the gospel. We've got Jesus. And there's three purposes here in this last point. It's to explain, to comfort, and again, to warn a little bit more. But again, he's wrapping up his own message. He explains that the reason that we have remained in the truth is not because of anything we've done. It's God's gracious gift of the Holy Spirit. And we need to, and things that, positive things, uh, praises we have, we need to make sure that all the glory goes to God. We don't boast in anything we do. John also wrote to comfort us. And when we see friends and loved ones that maybe leave the church for some of these heretical teachings or for other reasons, John tells us that the anointing we receive taught us things we need so the Holy Spirit abides in us that we do not fall for these false teachings. We, the anointing, we looked at this last week, we're the anointed ones as believers. It gives us, um, I think it gives us a, a deeper understanding of the word when we open the word. It gives us an ability to maybe to, to, to speak to our loved ones and, and 
You know, it's nothing that we're going to do to bring them back to the church. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God doing this. I'm not saving anyone. It's the Holy Spirit. And I get third caveat. John MacArthur, another pastor in the, C, in the G3 uh, organization, a great pastor, uh, well-respected in, um, in the community. John MacArthur, um, he said, you're, you're more likely to have gospel discussions with people that consider themselves churched or that they think them, themselves as saved than someone who's an atheist or, or worse. So John wrote to warn us, but to stay vigilant. Don't get comfortable or let our guard down. And this is where we get into proper context too, the interpretation of these b- biblical texts, uh, that why John was writing this letter. Where he's talking about that we don't need a teacher. Yes, we need a teacher, but if we're the anointed, we may have to get, we, we know the word. Yes, there's difficult passages, and there's passages you need commentaries, and, and maybe the help of your life group or a pastor or, or someone to help explain it to you. But he's not saying that we don't need godly leaders instructing the flock. That would invalidate this whole letter. Even the Apostle Paul taught us that God gave us gifted teachers to help the church mature and grow. And again, another reason why I'm so thankful for C3. But at the time that John was writing this letter, the Gnostic teachers, after that hidden special truth, they were teaching that false gospel, and it was taking people away from the good news. But he's teaching us that as the anointed, we have the Holy Spirit indwelled inside us, and it gives us that gift of discernment. We can see when people are being led astray. 2 Peter 1, verses 21 and 22, uh, 20 through 21 tells us, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Sort of another thing here to, to be careful for, uh, be careful to watch out for, is if someone's preaching from the pulpit, you need to be there taking notes. If you hear something that doesn't line up with what you have heard or believe, test it against the Bible. That's the beauty of the scripture and the gospel is that you and I can open the Bible. We've got the teacher edition with the answer key. There's my other teacher moment. And um, I used to tell that to my students when I taught history. If you didn't hear me teach something, go check it out. And the big one, and it's still one of my pet peeves today, is when I would teach that we don't live in a democracy. I would get letters from parents, and usually the parents would go straight to the principal instead of coming to me. But we can go straight, we can go straight to the, the most important reference book we have. But yes, there's complicated passages that you know, I need help with. Commentaries are great. Trained pastors are great. But we can grasp the truths of the Bible. We can grasp the truths of the Scripture. First Thessalonians 5, verse 21. But test everything and hold fast to what is good. It's not me telling you to test what we tell you. It's Scripture telling you. It's God telling you to test it. Any Christian can read and compare Scripture to Scripture and help it grasp with, through the help of the Holy Spirit the essential truths of the Bible. In John's words, He is true and it is not a lie. The gospel is the truth and it's not subjective. I can't look at the Bible one way and come up with my meaning. You look at the Bible your way and come up with your meaning and we're both right. Let's just love each other and we're right. No, the, the Bible is objective. It's absolutely true in every culture, every age, every tongue that's spoken. Any contradiction to the gospel is a lie. And we're not given direct revelation on, 
on par with Scripture today. If you hear someone say, hey, listen to what God told me. Does God teach us, talk to us? Yes, absolutely. I totally believe that. But it's not something that's going to change doctrine. Just be careful when you hear someone say that. Any insight from the Holy Spirit will lead us back to the Word and we get a deeper understanding of the Word and the sufficient power of Jesus Christ. New theology is old heresies. Nothing's changing what's in this book. The Spirit abides in you, but you also must abide in the Spirit. The last part of this verse should be taken as a command to abide in Him. Live closely, openly with the Holy Spirit. You say, well, He knows anyway. Yes, but He wants you to share it, open, repent. When you, I was um, talking to Joanne at one of the last Bible studies, um, we were talking about how we mess up every day, you know, but we've, we're forgiven. We're not going to be perfect. We live in a fallen and a broken world. We deal with everybody else that's in a fallen and a broken world. I would tell my daughter Lauren when she would have a bad day at work, you're dealing with people. We're fallen and broken. We're depraved sinners. But live closely and openly and allow the Holy Spirit in. Every area of your life, your thoughts and your emotions, live closely and openly before the Holy Spirit and His Word. And this will be your best safeguard also against spiritual deception. So John wrote this letter to assure us of our salvation. Also to warn us about deceivers. But he brings us back to the to the assurance we have in the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth. He is the light. He is the way. I just checked. I'm, why am I up here for 20, 25 minutes sharing this with you? Uh, it brings us back to the beauty of the gospel. If you don't have that relationship with Jesus, don't leave today without talking to one of us Tony, myself, Josiah, Matt about the amazing gift of grace and mercy and it's how you can achieve that everlasting and eternal joy again it's not about the here and now it's about eternity where is your focus, where is our focus especially this time of year, is it on the trappings of the world and how hectic and crazy things get right now or is, it where, or is it where we'll spend eternity worshiping with our Creator, with our mighty God? It's nothing you and I can do. Like I said, we live in a fallen and broken world. There's not a special handshake, a special prayer. It's admitting and repenting of your sins and accepting Jesus. Because we are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, and by Christ alone. And we're not promised tomorrow. So don't, I'll talk to him next week. Or I'll give him a call tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. And when you have that assurance, it changes things. Most of you know I've been in and out of the hospital the last three months. Um, And again, I can't imagine going through what I went through without having you guys... um, (laughs) Y'all have been wonderful, amazing. But it's Christ working through you guys. It's, it's also understanding, and I may have mentioned this before in another message, that things you hear as a child that you don't, I don't know what that really means. Like the peace that passes understanding. I knew it was in some hymns, and I've, I, I've heard it, and it was in the Bible. Yes, I got that. But when you get older and you have situations where you're laying in a hospital bed and you really don't know what's going on and you're finding out you, you, I'll go ahead and share this with you that it was genetic blood born or born with the blood clot uh, issue I had the assurance that if I didn't leave the hospital man I'm worshiping Jesus yes I'd be sad for Heidi and for my family and for my girls but just think of where where I am. And I've said this, and I'm not trying to get a laugh or, a, or, or in a 
a kick out of you. My funeral better be a party. No organ music allowed. <laughs> and the praise band better be singing. And But just realize, I, death, where's your sting? Death, where's your victory? It changes things. I was laying in that hospital bed. Yeah, I had my pity party. I didn't want to be in the hospital bed. But I had assurance that I didn't have just a few years ago. So that Paul Washer moment came back to me in, in the hospital down here. I have that assurance now. Yes, you're going to have setbacks. There's not a, oh, I want to sign up for the Christianity version where you don't get sick and you get all the nice cars and houses. That, that, mm -mm. We know better. But it's amazing that John wrote this letter 2,000 years ago, basically. And it still applies to us today. It's why we need to hear this every day, every week. And repent of your sins. Accept Jesus. And become more Christ-like each day. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for the assurances you give throughout your word that, that, um, that as believers that we're going to be with you one day worshiping and having the most amazing celebration ever and that we can share this with, with people and that you speak to them, that the Holy Spirit reaches them and changes their life. Well, just be with us over these next few weeks as, as things get busy and, and uh, hectic that uh, we keep you as the focus of, of why we're about to celebrate your birth. Um, Lord, we love you. We give you all the honor, power, and praise. It's your name we pray. Amen.